Hi. Thank you so much for tuning in to Haunted Places. I'm your host, Greg Polson. Before we start, I just wanted to let you know that our show is part of a great new program on TuneIn called TuneIn First Play. What that means is you can find free early episodes of this show exclusively on TuneIn. Go to TuneIn.com slash Haunted Places or search Haunted Places in the TuneIn app to find our episodes released one week early on their platform. So if you like the show, check out our free early episodes exclusively on TuneIn. Now, it's time for a scary story. It's a sticky summer night in New Orleans. The air is heavy with sweet honeysuckle and spicy gumbo. The cathedral's bells chimes 12 times, midnight. Out past the city lights, somewhere in the cypress trees, a drum pounds a steady rhythm. You follow it down to the bayou, right by the shore of Lake Pontchartrain. You stop right at the edge of the trees. A crowd of people dance around a bonfire, moving in a way that seems inhuman. By the light of the full moon, a woman raises a black cat above the fire. She raises a butcher knife in the other hand and slices the cat's throat open. Blood pours down her hands, staining her white dress. She tosses the cat into the boiling pot over the bonfire. The dancers move faster and faster. A flash of lightning rips across the sky. The drumming stops. The woman's head snaps around and suddenly, she's staring right at you. Welcome to Haunted Places. I'm Greg Polson. Every other Thursday, I take you to the scariest, eeriest, most haunted, real places on Earth. This week, join me on a supernatural journey to 19th century New Orleans and the home of voodoo queen Marie Laveau. To this day, it's haunted. If you can't get enough of Haunted Places, don't forget to subscribe. You can find us haunting your favorite podcast directory, as well as on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast, and on Twitter at Parcast Network. Today I'll be walking you through the home of Marie Laveau, the notorious voodoo queen of New Orleans in the 1800s. She was born and died in this humble cottage on St. Anne Street, and some say her spirit never left it. Accounts of Marie's cottage after her death differ from those during her life, when it was known as the most beautiful home in the French Quarter. Marie's obituary described the home as quaint, with a high, frail fence. Years after she died, an 1890 newspaper sketch of the cottage there are no photos of the place. Shows a simple abode. Wooden board floors, one chimney, a porch, few windows. More than a century ago, the Laveau family cottage was torn down and a new home was built in its place. But as hard as they tried to erase the great voodoo queen's mark, the dark energy she summoned at her altar still linger in the air. Ask the people of New Orleans about Marie Laveau and you'll get a different answer every time. She was young, old, light, dark, rich, poor, a saint, a demon. She controlled the city with black magic, or blackmail. She was a savvy con woman who played on old superstitions for profit. Yet, pictures would fly off walls when she walked past your house. Marie Laveau never allowed herself to be photographed. And her neighbors insist that the many paintings that have been done of her look nothing like the woman they remember. But they all agree on this. Her lips were as red as blood. Her long black curls were always pulled into a headscarf that folded with seven points, like a crown. And once you saw her, you would never be able to forget her. The truth is that voodoo queen Marie Laveau never existed. There was Marie Catherine Laveau, and there was her daughter, Marie Heloise Eucharistie Laveau. And there might have been a third woman known as Marie Laveau who has never been identified in the historical record. But the voodoo queen that lives in the memory of New Orleans is some combination of all of them, a legend that took on a life of its own and refuses to die. 
1798, a merchant and former slave named Catherine Henry built a small cottage on St. Anne Street in New Orleans. Three years later, her granddaughter, Marie Catherine Laveau, was born in that same cottage. It was a four-room wooden house with a big garden out front where honeysuckle and fig trees hung over the edge of the roof. Everyone said it was the most beautiful house in the French Quarter. But beneath the placid facade, something sinister lurked in the little house. It was the heart of Louisiana's voodoo practice, the dwelling place of ancient spirits, both benevolent and evil. When Africans were brought over to Louisiana as slaves, they were forced to adopt the religion of their French captors, Roman Catholicism. Over time, they mixed the saints and symbols of Catholicism with their traditional African rituals to form a new religion called Voodoo, which roughly translates to those who serve the spirits. Before voodoo became infamous for black magic and spooky ceremonies, it was simply a way to keep old traditions alive in the New World. In the 19th century, most of the people in New Orleans, including Marie Laveau, were of mixed French and African heritage. They worshipped African deities alongside Catholic saints, merging the two belief systems into one religion that honored both sides of their family history. But voodoo was more than a religion. It was a means of survival. When epidemics of yellow fever or cholera hit the city, the women of color banded together to heal the dying with African folk remedies. Plants and herbs that were long known for their healing effects took on a new significance in America, where doctors were struggling to control epidemics with Western medicine. Marie Catherine began her career as a voodoo healer when she was a young woman in the 1820s. Struck by the death and illness all around her, she studied under the local witch doctors and fever nurses to learn herbal remedies and spells that could alleviate suffering. She traveled through the muck-covered streets with charm bags of tar and brimstone. When she came across someone who was convulsing, she pulled out a match, lit the charm under their nose, and immediately the seizures stopped. Marie became so famous for her healing work that even when there was no illness going around, neighbors called on her to fix their daily problems with similar voodoo remedies. She began practicing another voodoo technique called Grigri. Grigri is a type of voodoo amulet that can bring anything from good luck to painful suffering to the person who possesses it. It's often considered a form of malevolent black magic, but Marie was known to use it for good. She set up an altar in the entrance room of the cottage and covered it with candles, statues of saints, and gifts of candy and liquor for the spirits. When someone came to her with a problem, she created small bags, boxes, or dolls at the altar and filled them with special combinations of herbs, minerals, and animal parts. She said a prayer to call down the spirit whose assistance she required. Sometimes an African deity like Oshun, the goddess of love, or a Catholic saint like St. Anthony, the patron of lost souls. When she was done, she would give the amulet or doll to her customers, and the spirits would leave the cottage. Or so she hoped. Her charms could fix anything, from cheating husbands to unpaid mortgages. In addition to the work at her altar, she went from house to house, selling love charms in the drawing rooms of the elite and giving lucky amulets to slaves who wanted to escape. Her grigri always worked, but many people thought her miraculous abilities weren't magic at all. Rather, she was so well-connected she could pull the strings of the entire city. While Marie was establishing herself as a voodoo healer, she married a man from Haiti named Jacques Perry. Not much is known about him or about their relationship, but it's likely he moved into the cottage with the rest of the Laveau family. And then, just one year after their wedding, Jacques Perry disappeared. Exactly what happened to him is still a mystery. There was no record of his death. No evidence exists that he continued living, either in America or in Haiti. He simply vanished. Many people speculated that Marie had used voodoo to get rid of him. After all, his body was never found. A year after his disappearance, 
Jacques was assumed to be dead, and Marie legally became a widow. Soon after that, she had a new man under her spell, the wealthy trader who lived down the road, a man named Christophe Glapion. Marie and Christophe could never legally marry because Christophe was white. Interracial marriage was illegal in Louisiana, but the couple lived together for the rest of their lives in the Laveau family cottage. They had seven children, but only two daughters survived past childhood, Marie Heloise and Philomene. The two girls grew up in the heart of the city's voodoo culture. Marie Catherine was still a young woman, but she was already one of the most well-known voodoo priestesses in the community. She began holding weekly ceremonies at the family cottage. Every Friday evening, the local women would crowd around the room and thump their feet in rhythm. Marie led them in old Creole invocations to call down voodoo spirits called loa. The loa are similar to gods or demons, and they can be kind or harmful, depending on how the ritual is performed. One neighborhood boy swore he saw lightning flash through the room when Marie called down Agau, the spirit of thunder and storms. Some nights, there were so many visitors that the stomping and chanting would spill out into the garden. They spread a white tablecloth on the grass, and they covered it with bottles of liquor and pictures of saints. They danced around it all night, singing so loud the whole neighborhood could hear. On special holidays, the festivities were even bigger. The most important voodoo celebration of the year was the Feast of St. John, the Catholic patron saint of New Orleans. The slaves called him High John the Conqueror. They told each other stories about how he was going to rise up and bring freedom to his people in America. He was honored as one of the most important figures in voodoo practice, and Marie made sure his midsummer feast day became a citywide celebration. Every summer, on the eve of St. John's Day, Marie would hold feasts on the shore of Lake Pontchartrain. Hundreds of men and women would gather in the swamp dressed in white robes. They lit a bonfire and circled around it, chanting old Creole songs to the beat of a drum. Marie led them in sacrificing an animal, usually a black goat or a black rooster. Blood sacrifices were necessary to invoke many of the more powerful voodoo spirits. They cooked the animal over the fire and ate it together, leaving a piece buried in the ground as an offering to the spirits. They took off their robes and danced around the bonfire until the sun rose. As Marie Heloise grew up, she became the star of her mother's St. John's Eve feasts. She could dance like nobody else, swaying and contorting like she was possessed by some divine spirit. The people around town simply knew her as Marie II. Her younger sister, Philomene, stayed back. As she later recalled, she never knew how to dance. She preferred the calmer ceremonies at the local Catholic church. Philomene wasn't the only one skeptical of voodoo. The Americans, who recently annexed Louisiana, were terrified of the mysterious Creole religion that had developed in New Orleans. Most of them didn't believe the voodoo queens had supernatural powers, but they did fear that allowing slaves and free people of color to congregate together would incite a slave rebellion. When New Orleans was under French control, free people of color had a vibrant culture of their own. But after the Louisiana Purchase, the American government began to impose their own system of racial stratification on the people of New Orleans. It was the summer of 1850 when the Anglo-Americans and the local government finally had enough of voodoo. It all began on St. John's Eve. The police surrounded a private home, where Marie Catherine was holding a voodoo gathering with a hundred or so other women. They raided the house and destroyed their altar. One of the officers took a wooden statue of a woman with the lower body of a snake that belonged to Marie. The women fled in terror. The police scrambled to grab anyone they could catch. Marie escaped, but a dozen women were taken to jail and charged with unlawful assembly. They protested that their freedom of religion was being violated, but the judge dismissed their complaints. The next morning, Marie marched over to the magistrate's office and demanded that the police return the wooden statue they had stolen from her during the raid. She took them to court, 
and the judge ruled in her favor. The statue was returned. But the voodoo raids continued for the rest of the summer. The police should have learned their lesson. Don't cross Marie Laveau. From that day on, she was determined to show them who really ran the city. Marie Catherine turned her focus to helping the imprisoned. People said she could get anyone released from jail, either by using voodoo charms or blackmailing the judges, depending on who you ask. She did her work at the altar in the cottage. She learned rituals to control judges and juries without even stepping into the courtroom. One of her most famous rituals could render witnesses unable to testify. She cut open a cow's tongue and wrote the names of witnesses inside it with a needle. Then she froze the tongue solid with a block of ice. When the witnesses got up to testify, they found they couldn't speak. On another occasion, she put a curse on a picture of St. Peter, keeper of the keys of heaven. Then she walked up to the iron gates of a death row cell and showed the picture to the guards. Inexplicably, they ran away in fear, leaving the cell door open. Marie clearly had power over the city, but many didn't believe it was magical in nature. They thought she was using bribery and blackmail to get favorable verdicts from the judges. But whether it was voodoo or social connections, no one could deny that Marie knew how to command authority. One day, she pulled a trick that New Orleans would never forget. It was a hot afternoon, not a cloud in the sky. Hundreds had gathered in the city to watch the hanging of two convicted murderers. The hangmen walked the prisoners up to the gallows and put the nooses around their necks. And as they were saying their last words, the sky turned red. The church bells chimed noon. A flash of lightning tore through the sky and torrents of rain poured down. The trapdoors of the gallows fell open. Then, through the rain and lightning, everyone saw two empty nooses swinging in the wind. The prisoners were on the ground, crawling away on their hands and knees. The crowd rushed forward as the guards scrambled to keep them in order. And suddenly, the rain stopped and the sky turned back to normal. A woman in a long dress and headscarf creased with seven points glided away from the crowd. One of the onlookers saw her and said, there goes Marie Laveau. The prisoners were caught and hanged again. But after that incident, Louisiana became the first state in the Union to outlaw public executions. While Marie tended to the imprisoned, her daughters were growing up. Marie II still danced at the voodoo feasts, but she wasn't interested in becoming a priestess. As her great nephew later put it, she would rather dance and make love than worship the spirits. She strutted down the streets in flowing dresses and jingling gold jewelry, and she tied her long black hair under her scarf, just like her mother. In fact, she looked so much like her mother that the two were almost indistinguishable. While Marie II was dancing and flirting, Philomene was learning how to boil St. John's wort and mix herbs and roots to heal the yellow fever victims that lined the streets. Marie I knew Philomene didn't have much talent for voodoo, but she was a dedicated nurse. Marie II wasn't dedicated to anything. And then, late one night, Marie II was asleep in her bedroom at the back of the cottage when the door creaked open. Moonlight poured in from the open door, illuminating a long black rattlesnake gliding across the floor. It might have been a manifestation of Tijon Petro, a Creole serpent deity with dark magic powers. The snake coiled up her bedpost and spoke. It told her she was born with a great power, and it was her birthright to become the next voodoo queen. The next morning, Marie II asked the local voodoo doctor to initiate her into the practice. Marie II learned how to charm amulets and voodoo dolls, how to mix potions for healing and luck, and how to control courtrooms the way her mother did. She did all this good work at the altar in the cottage's entrance room, but she didn't stop there. 
she set up a separate altar in the back room where she would do her bad work. Dark charms to break up relationships, spread confusion, and even kill. This altar was similar to the other one. It was as long as the room, covered in a white tablecloth and candles. But instead of relics of Catholic saints, it had four statues, one on each corner. A bear, a lion, a tiger, and a wolf. Marie II would take on any clients that could pay. It didn't matter to her whether she was helping or hurting. Her visitors said she would light candles and go into a trance, chanting, swaying back and forth, faster and faster, until it seemed like she was possessed. Then she stopped moving and opened her eyes. When she spoke, the voice that came out of her lips wasn't her own. Whatever spirit was possessing her called itself the Good Mother. It gave the visitors instructions on how to pray to fix their problems. Sometimes it required sacrifices of food or flowers or an animal's blood. Then the candles flickered out and Marie snapped back into consciousness. It's not clear whether the spirit she was contacting was a benevolent goddess or a demon or something else entirely. But the visitors followed her orders without question. The back room took on a strange energy. It seemed as if evil spirits Marie II was contacting didn't want to leave. When the powerful demons possessed a body, it could turn violent in an instant. The demons wouldn't hesitate to kill the person they were possessing as a sacrifice. Sometimes it took days for a priest or priestess to regain control of their body after a possession. And sometimes, the spirit never left them at all. Meanwhile, Philomene had gotten married and was having children of her own. They all lived in the cottage on St. Anne Street with the rest of the Laveaux. But Philomene wouldn't participate in the weekly voodoo ceremonies that were still held at their house. The only relics in her family's quarters were rosaries and pictures of saints. Philomene would never belong in her family of voodoo priestesses, and with the darkness emanating from Marie II's room, she no longer wanted to belong. Around this time, something strange starts happening in the recollections of Marie's friends and neighbors. When they talk about Marie Laveau, they describe a young woman bouncing down the street and dancing at the bayou. But Marie I would have been an aging woman by the 1860s. They seem to be describing Marie II, not her mother. The lives of the two Laveaux were already starting to blur into one. Time for a quick change of subject. I don't know about you, but if I'm listening to ghost stories, I want to be cozied up in my bed with my dog snoozing nearby and a nice warm meal to fill me up. That's why I've been using HelloFresh. With their perfectly portioned ingredients, I can cook a full, healthy meal in 30 minutes and have the rest of the evening to myself. And with HelloFresh, cooking actually becomes enjoyable when you're making something new, no matter how much experience you have in the kitchen. HelloFresh's new fall recipes and easy-to-follow instructions guarantee your meal will turn out to be delicious. Just last week, I made crispy chicken with cranberry arugula salad and garlic toast in under 30 minutes. And it was the best home-cooked meal I'd had in a long time. So when you get home from work after a long day and you just want to cozy up and listen to your favorite podcast, make sure you do it with a HelloFresh meal. For less than $10 a meal, trust me when I tell you that HelloFresh is worth it. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com and enter HAUNTED30. That's code HAUNTED30 for $30 off your first week using HelloFresh. I hope you've been enjoying Haunted Places. I certainly have. In order to produce the show and keep it free to listen to, we need to find some amazing advertisers. But we don't want just any advertisers. We want to use this opportunity to connect our listeners to products and services that you're actually interested in. To do that, we need to know a little more about you. 
So please go to podsurvey.com slash haunted places and take a quick anonymous survey that will help us get to know you a little better. That way we can show advertisers how fantastic our listeners are. Plus, once you've completed the survey, you can enter to win a $100 Amazon gift card. The survey takes about 5 to 10 minutes and it's all easy questions, don't worry. And if you want to get to know each other non-anonymously, feel free to reach out on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Here at Parcast, we love hearing from our listeners. Again, that's podsurvey.com slash haunted places. That's P-O-D-S-U-R-V-E-Y dot com slash haunted places. And you can win a $100 gift card to Amazon. Thanks for your help. Now, let's get back to the story. After the Civil War, the prejudice against voodoo only grew stronger. Slavery was gone, but in its place was a new system of racial separation and violence that fractured the Creole community. Voodoo was labeled as demonic and unnatural. A local newspaper even proposed that voodoo practitioners should be lynched. But Marie II refused to back down. She kept on strutting down the street like she owned the city. Philomene, on the other hand, wanted nothing to do with voodoo. She still lived at the St. Anne Street cottage, but if anyone asked, she denied any connection to the voodoo queen. She only referred to herself by her married name, Madame Lejean. If Philomene answered the door when Marie's clients called, she would shoo them away and tell them Marie Laveau didn't exist. Whatever was happening at the altar in the back room, Philomene refused to talk about it. As the years went by, the people of New Orleans began to notice that Marie Laveau didn't age. She'd been ruling over the voodoo community for almost 40 years, but she still looked as young and beautiful as she always had. Her voodoo powers must be real. She had become immortal. The truth is that, slowly and silently, Marie II had replaced her mother as voodoo queen. As the elder Marie got older and weaker, she became housebound and could no longer perform her duties. Marie II took over the daily Grigri practices, and then the weekly gatherings, and then the St. John's Eve feast. No one ever noticed that the two were separate people. There seemed to be only one Marie that was growing younger, more beautiful, and more powerful over time. On the rare occasions when they spotted the old woman with the seven-pointed headscarf hobbling down the street, the neighbors said, there goes Marie Laveau's mother. Under Marie II's guidance, voodoo became more popular than ever. The white establishment tried to demonize the voodoos, but it backfired. Everyone wanted to be part of the taboo ceremonies they read about in the papers. Marie II was more than willing to play along. She invited journalists and politicians to her voodoo celebrations, turning what were once sacred Creole rituals into a spectacle for the white elite. The St. John's Eve Festival drew bigger crowds every year until it had become a citywide night of dancing and debauchery more than a religious rite. By 1870, even the upper-class Catholics who despise voodoo by day came out to eat, drink, and carouse all night. Marie Laveau was becoming more famous than ever. Tales of her divine powers and mysterious rituals spread all over Louisiana. By now, barely anyone remembered that Marie the I and Marie the II were different people. Marie the I was still quietly working at her entrance room altar or visiting the hospitals with healing remedies but she had lost her prominence and her name. Marie II was now the voodoo queen Marie Laveau. But Marie II's black magic threatened to come back around and curse her in return. She was blamed for casting all types of evil curses, breaking up relationships, making children sick, or causing storms that destroyed houses. One summer, a neighboring woman named Mrs. LeBlanc accused Marie of putting a charm bag on her doorstep that made her family sick. Marie II countered by bringing legal charges against Mrs. LeBlanc for insulting and abusing her. 
Of course, Marie won the trial, and it was Mrs. LeBlanc who had to pay her for disrupting the peace. Fighting Marie Laveau in the courtroom was impossible, so her enemies resorted to violence. One day, a man on the street attacked Marie II with a knife, claiming that she had hexed him. It quickly became a massive fight. All the voodoos of the neighborhood against all the devout Catholics who hated voodoo before the police arrived to break up the commotion. Marie II had to do something to stop her control from slipping, so she learned a curse to put on her enemies. A curse so severe that it made them wish they had never crossed her. She lit black candles on her altar and wrote the names of her enemies on the candles with a needle. She put her hands on the altar and prayed that the Lord would wither their bodies and make their bones crumble and leave their children weak and paralyzed. Did the curse work? Her enemies certainly thought it did. She had become a fearsome figure, a far cry from the elderly Marie I, who was still visiting the sick and imprisoned. And then, in 1871, suddenly and without explanation, Marie I completely renounced voodoo. She retreated permanently to the cottage and turned back to devout Catholicism. She filled the house with crosses, rosaries, and pictures of saints. Philomene took care of her while Marie II still practiced her dark voodoo in the back room. It was a house divided. So what caused the great voodoo queen to forsake her practice? Was she alarmed by the turn her daughter's black magic had taken? Or was she afraid for her soul as she inched closer to death? When a reporter from the local paper, the Picayune, came to speak to Marie I, she told him, I am no voodoo now. I am a believer in the holy faith. She told him voodoo had degenerated in the past few years. It was nothing like the faith she practiced when she was queen. Whenever they were asked about Marie II, Marie I and Philomene would both fall silent. They never mentioned her in interviews. Philomene actually denied that she ever existed at all. Whether they were ashamed or afraid, they refused to acknowledge the new voodoo queen that still lived in their home. The younger Marie was still the voodoo leader in name, but she was becoming reclusive and difficult to locate. No one ever saw her away from her altar except at the annual St. John's Eve feast. She was seen so rarely that some people believed she was dead. Newspapers began to speculate that she didn't exist at all. Marie's last and greatest St. John's Eve was in 1872. Nobody saw her for nine days before the feast. As the night commenced, she was nowhere to be found. Everyone thought she had disappeared for good, so they started without her. They lit the bonfire, chanted an opening song, and then called for the voodoo queen to join them. Marie II emerged from the lake holding burning candles in each hand. She walked up to the shore and began the rituals like she did every year. And then, at exactly midnight, everyone followed her into the water. The others stopped in the shallow water, but she waded out into the tide, plunged below the surface, and disappeared. No one saw her for another nine days. That was the last St. John's Eve feast either Marie Laveau ever held. Some people thought that Marie II had died in the lake that night. Others were sure they still saw her walking down the street but no one had actually spoken to her in months. Eventually, it became clear that she had fully disappeared. The question has still never been answered. What happened to Marie Laveau II? The local legends hold that one day in 1873, Marie II was holding a voodoo dance near the Bayou St. John when a dark storm cloud appeared on the horizon. In all her years, Marie had never had trouble with the rain. The sky was always clear during her ceremonies. Some people even thought she could control the storms, bringing down the thunder and lightning at her whim. But this storm 
was beyond her control. As one of her friends recalled, Marie looked out at the water as the tide began to roll and said, I want to die in that lake. At that moment, a massive wave came up and swept over the shore, pulling Marie into the water. But her neighbors can't agree on what happened next. Some say she was never found. Others are sure her body washed up dead the next morning. And some insist she lived through it and kept living for as long as eight years after the storm. What we do know is Marie Laveau never appeared at a St. John's Eve feast again. Later that summer in 1873, three days after the first St. John's Eve feast in decades without a Marie Laveau reigning over it, a young girl was walking down the Bayou St. John when she saw a woman in a dress and veil floating in the water among the branches. She was pale and motionless, her arms folded over her chest like a corpse in a coffin. The girl lifted the veil and the woman's eyes flashed open. The woman whispered, I love you, my child, and I don't love many people. I am Marie Laveau. The girl replied that she thought Marie Laveau was dead. The woman said, I know, Marie Laveau's been dead before. I'm a strong woman. Whatever became of Marie II, the rest of the family never spoke of her again after 1873. She disappeared so quietly and so completely that it was as if she had never existed at all. Eight years passed without any mention of the voodoo queen until Marie the first died in 1881 and Philomene finally broke her silence. Philomene went to the district courthouse with Marie the second son, Victor Pierre. They both swore that Marie Heloise Eucharista died 19 years ago in 1862. If Marie Heloise really died in 1862, who was the vibrant young Marie Laveau who reigned over New Orleans for 10 years after that? Was there another woman posing as Marie? Another voodoo devotee who agreed to take up the mantle after Marie II died? Did Marie I have another daughter or granddaughter who got lost in the historical record? Or was the Laveau family lying? Maybe Marie II did live past 1862. There was never any evidence of records to confirm her date of death. But why would they lie? And why were they all so silent about Marie II for decades until right after Marie I finally died? If Marie did die in 1862, maybe the voodoo queen of the 1860s and 70s was something else. A ghost? Or a resurrection? Or a projection of dark magic that kept living in the Laveau cottage even after her body died? What became of Marie II remains a mystery. There was no official record of her death and there's no agreement on the location of her remains. She's as mystifying in death as she was in life. New voodoo queens replaced Marie after she was gone, but none of them matched the iconic status. The voodoo culture was never again as powerful as it had been under Marie's control. Philomene kept living in the cottage on St. Anne Street until her own death in 1897. She always talked about tearing down the house and rebuilding it, but she never had the money to do it. She wanted the house gone, as if the remnants of her voodoo family legacy would be destroyed with it. When Philomene died, she finally got her wish. The house was sold, and the new owners demolished it. They built another house on the same foundation, and the dark energies that were summoned by the Laveau family are still there in the floorboards. A beautiful woman with a seven-pointed headscarf is still often seen wandering around the streets where the old house once stood. Perhaps one of the Maries had angered the gods of death so severely that they refused to take their souls. Maybe they became spirits themselves, listening and waiting to be summoned by voodoo believers. 
Or maybe the powerful spirits that were called down to the voodoo altar never left. Perhaps the serpent Tijon Petro, or the mysterious Good Mother, are still there, waiting for a new priestess to possess. A few years ago, a couple visiting New Orleans rented out the house that now stands where the Laveau cottage used to be. In the middle of the night, they heard chanting and drumming coming from somewhere nearby. They looked outside, but there was nothing there. Eventually, they realized the sound was coming from their own living room. In the morning, they found a single feather on the floor in the center of the living room. In voodoo, a single feather is a relic that brings good luck. Maybe Marie's spirit was trying to help her new visitors the way she used to help her voodoo clients. But not all of Marie's alleged hauntings are so benign. In 1956, a writer named Robert Talent wrote a historical fiction novel about Marie's life called The Voodoo Queen. The novel took liberties with the facts, and most reviewers agree that it portrayed Marie in a negative, racist light. One year after The Voodoo Queen was published, Robert Talent woke up in his home in New Orleans, poured a glass of water, and dropped dead on the kitchen floor. It might have been a coincidence, or maybe Marie's spirit wasn't happy with the way she was being portrayed. Robert had read all the first-hand accounts from the people of New Orleans. He should have known not to cross Marie Laveau. Over a century after Marie Laveau's death, the legacy of voodoo is still alive. Thousands of visitors come to the St. Louis Cemetery every year to visit the Laveau family tomb. They leave gifts of flowers, candy, or beads, hoping that the voodoo queen will grant their wishes. If their wishes come true, the visitors come back and mark an X on the grave. The hundreds of X marks on her tomb are evidence enough that Marie Laveau's power still reigns over New Orleans. Her body might have perished, but her spirit is too strong to die. The St. John's Eve feast is still held in New Orleans every year, although it's become more of a cultural festival than a religious ritual. If you go out on the lake on St. John's Eve, you might encounter the spirit of the first and greatest voodoo queen. But be careful not to summon something more sinister. Thanks for listening to Haunted Places. Don't forget to subscribe to Haunted Places on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or any other podcast directory. If you like what you hear, leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We are on Facebook and Instagram, at Parcast, and Twitter, at Parcast Network. A new episode comes out every other Thursday. Haunted Places was created by Max Cutler. It's a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It's produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Haunted Places is written by Kate Gallagher. I'm Greg Polson. I'm thrilled to announce that Haunted Places is partnered with TuneIn. If you aren't familiar with TuneIn, TuneIn is a phenomenal podcast platform with this amazing new program for listeners called First Play. Thanks to TuneIn First Play, we're able to release episodes of Haunted Places for you a week early on their app. Yes, that means there's another episode of Haunted Places on TuneIn right now. All you have to do is download TuneIn and listen. The app and our show are both free. You can get the TuneIn app on your phone, or you can go to TuneIn.com and listen there, too. Find all our new episodes one week early at TuneIn.com slash Haunted Places.